Okay, let me briefly summarize what we did so far. I showed you how the polynomial method is able to, um, well, first of all, to, uh, to be used for point counting, not yet for character sums. This will come in a moment. Um, and our go goal is now to find good bounds for character sums, as you can see on the screen, ideally mixed character sums, where you sum over a finite field and you have an additive and a multiplicative character and inside a rational function or a polynomial. And um, what we have proved so far would give us a bound with big dependence on the polynomials f and g, uh, and also to some extent to the characters. Um, so it would only be good in terms of q, the size of the finite field. And what I promised last time is that we now use L functions um, to bootstrap the, the argument and to come up with somehow a self-improving um, machinery that somehow automatically lets all the implied constant disappear. Okay, and in order to set up the stage, um, we look at all rational functions that are products, uh, sorry, that are quotients of two monic polynomials. And we write them in this form. And we look at such uh, elements R and G, this is what we call G star, uh, where there is no zero of and no pole at the zeros of our fixed polynomial f. So we fix once and for all a polynomial f having zeros at minus gamma k. And then we also fix a polynomial g. This will be put in the additive character. Um, yeah. And we define a map from rational functions to elements in fq, two maps. One of them is curly. Uh, bracket and one of them is square bracket and um, one of them is multiplicative and the other one is additive and so we can put them into a multiplicative or an additive character and that's what we are going to do now so fix a character of fq a multiplicative one fq star and an additive character of fq and then for R in G star, define the combined character Xi of R is going to be Chi of curly bracket R. Curly bracket R is an element in FQ star and Psi of square bracket R. Okay, and we extend this like we do with Dirichlet characters, extend this to all polynomials uh, H in G without G star by zero. So whenever you have a polynomial that is not in G star, we just say the value zero. Okay, so this becomes a completely multiplicative function. So Xi is a completely multiplicative function. On the set of monic polynomials. All right, and as I said earlier, one of the important tricks is to look at extension fields. Uh, a character sum alone is not so interesting. It's much more interesting if we view it inside a tower of extension fields. So for new in N, define chi nu to be the norm composed with chi. So this is a map. So this is a, a character in FQ to the new star and psi nu is psi composed with the trace. And this is a character of fq to the nu. Okay, and correspondingly, we define psi nu 
which is the combined thing. So xi nu of r is chi nu of curly bracket r times psi nu of square bracket r. So this will be used to go to extension fields. Okay, now that we define the corresponding L functions. So for a monic polynomial H in FQ X, define the norm, norm of H is just Q to the degree of H. Notice that this depends on the ground field. If I change the ground field, I also change the notion of norm. Yeah, so for the norm in fq to the new x, we write new and new. Okay. Okay, and then we can define the L function associated to a character, or let's say to a completely multiplicative function for a completely multiplicative function chi and real part of s bigger than one define the l function l s chi it's a sum over all monic polynomials all polynomials modulo units chi of h over norm h to the power s. This is absolutely convergent. You simply count how many polynomials are there of a given degree, and then you see it's absolutely convergent in real part s greater than one. And because it's multiplic uh, completely multiplicative, it has an Euler product as a product of monic irreducible polynomials, one minus chi of h over norm h to the s inverse. Okay, and correspondingly, we define L nu of S chi, or let's say, we specialize this already to the character that is of interest to us. This is the character psi. So this is the sum over all H in F Q to the nu X monic. Psi nu of h over norm nu h to the power s. Okay, so the character psi is of interest for us because it captures the properties of the polynomial f and g, right? Because the notion of curly and square bracket depends on f and g, so the character remembers the polynomials f and g. All right. Now, of course, for an L function, I mean, the, the interesting thing is, um, does it have a pole, for instance? And so, as with Dirichli L functions, we need that our character is non-trivial in order to make sure that it has no pole, for instance, at S equals one. And the question is, when is the character Xi trivial? Or when, it is, when is it non-trivial? This is the content of the following lemma. So take chi in fq star hat, psi in fq hat. And we need the following assumptions. Suppose that chi is non-trivial. Chi to the d is trivial. So chi is of order d or order dividing d. And y to the d minus f of x is absolutely irreducible. Or suppose that psi is non-trivial. And 
and z to the q minus z minus g of x is absolutely irreducible. Then the character xi defined above is non-trivial. Okay, so that means, I mean, these are, okay, these are the assumptions that we need anyway. And so if at least one of the two characters is non-trivial, if both of them are trivial, the whole question is trivial anyway. So if, if one of the two characters is trivial, uh, is non-trivial, and we have some absolutely irreducibility conditions, uh, then we are good. Okay, the proof is not particularly hard. You can find it in Schmidt's book, chapter 2.9. All right, and now comes one of the key results. This L function that we just defined, this L function here, knows everything about the character sum we are interested in. So we can recover all the information on the character sum from the L function. And this is the content of the following theorem. Now, obviously, the L function is a polynomial or a rat or okay, it's a power series in Q to the minus S, right? Because each denominator is a power of Q to the minus S. So it's a power series or perhaps a polynomial in Q to the minus S. And what are the coefficients? So we have L S psi is one plus c1q to the minus s plus c2q to the minus 2s and so on. And the first coefficient c1 is the character sum we're interested in. That's some chi of f of x times psi of g of x for x in fq. And here we apply the convention that chi of zero is zero. I mean, chi is defined on fq star. So if f of x happens to be zero, then we just say that chi of zero is zero. Okay, so the first coefficient in the, um, in the L series is the character sum we are interested in. So this L function is, is an interesting object. In addition, if the character is non-trivial, if xi is non-trivial, so if 3.3 .3 holds, then this power series terminates, then Ls xi is actually a polynomial in Q to the minus S of degree n plus m minus one. And just to remember, so n is the number of distinct zeros of f and m is the degree of g. Yeah, and so all other coefficients vanish. Okay, I um, prove the first statement and I refer to Schmidt's book for the second statement. It's not hard, but it, it's a computation. Okay, so what is the, the coefficient? So by definition, CT equals, well, the sum over all H and G star, monic polynomial degree of h equals t psi of h. Okay, and one can show, which I'm not going to do here, but again, it's not very hard. It takes about three quarters of a page. One can show 
that CT vanishes for T greater than or equal to N plus M if Psi is non-trivial. Okay, and now I compute C1 for you. What is C1? Well, we have to sum over all polynomials of degree one. These are just the linear polynomials. So we are summing the linear monic polynomials. So this is a sum over all FQ, Xi of X plus A. These are all the linear polynomials, but we must make sure that they are in G star. So they must not have a zero at some gamma K. So A plus gamma K is non-zero for all K. So those are excluded. And now plugging in the definition of the character Xi, this is just Chi of F of A, Psi of G of A, whenever F of A is non-zero. But then I can artificially include the points where F of A equals zero because Chi of zero is zero. All right. So once again, this L function is uh, a polynomial in Q to the minus S. We know its degree. We know how many coefficients it has. And the first coefficient is the character sum we are interested in. All right. Now comes the step, what happens in extension fields? What happens if I, if I look at the same character sum but over a higher degree field. And this is the content of the following lemma. So if I take L nu of S psi, if I take the extension field Q to the nu, then this factorizes into L functions of the basic field s minus two pi i k over nu log q psi and k runs from one to nu. So I can express the L function of the extension field as a product of shifted L functions of the basic field, of the base field. Okay. And again, I don't give you the proof. You can find it in Schmidt's book. It's again, not very hard. It uses Galois theory. And recall that this is a cyclic extension. FQ to the new over FQ is cyclic. So the Galois group is Z modulo nu Z, okay? And this is the analog of the corresponding number field formula for cyclotomic fields. So this is the analog of, so if you take the Dedekind zeta function, take the Dedekind zeta function of a cyclotomic field, then it factorizes into Dirichlet L functions. So if you take uh, K is Q adjoint zeta Q with a Q Qth root of unity. Okay, and this has with Galois group, Z mod QZ star. Yeah, so that's the exact same thing. It's also, it's a cyclic Galois group. Um, let's say Q's prime, for instance. And um, 
yeah, it's it's uh, it's the same sort of factorization. Yeah, so the the L function of the extension field factorizes into L functions of the ground field, um, shifted ones, and um, yeah, this just uh, is a reflection of the fact that the Galois group of this extension field is cyclic. All right, and this implies the following corollary. Now, my basic L function is a polynomial of a certain degree in Q to the minus S, so I can factorize this at least in the algebraic closure in this way. So there are some numbers omega j, and uh, I can factorize this into, into linear factors. And if I have this factorization, then the L function over the new extension field is just product over new omega j to the new q to the minus s. So the roots of the L function of the ground field determine the roots of the L function in the extension field. Yeah, in a very simple way. It's just the new powers of the original roots. All right, just quick. I mean, this is a very, the, the proof is so simple that I can just give it in two lines. Um, so how do I compute the factorization of the extension L function? So L nu of S psi is, as we have seen, the product over K L of S minus two pi I K over new log Q psi. And each of them can be factorized. So this is product over K, product over J, one minus omega J. And this shift just gives you an exponential E of K over new Q to the minus S. K runs from one to new. And now if you exchange products and first compute the K product, then you see this is just the factorization of the cyclotomic polynomial. So this is product J one minus omega nu, omega J to the power nu. Q to the minus new S. Yeah, if you just factorize one minus X to the new in linear factors, then this is what you get. Valentin, does that mean in your statement, there should be a Q to the minus new S instead of Q to the minus S? Uh, that is correct. And this is what we need to have, of course, thank you. I mean, this is obvious that we need to have this because uh, over the extension field, every polynomial, I mean, the, the norm is now in terms of Q to the new. So of course it must be something in terms of Q to the new. Uh, there, there are no other norms that come up. Yes, correct. All right. Yeah, so once again, uh, the L function of the character, so that, yeah, the L function of the character sum of the ground field determines the L function of the character sum in the extension field. In, again, in a very simple way. I mean, the roots are just of the, in, in the extension field are just the nth powers of the roots downstairs. This goes by the way, uh, this goes by the name Hasse-Davenport relations. Uh, I'll give you an example in a moment. Um, let me just first give you one more corollary. So for new in N, define the character sum in the extension field, which is of course what you would expect to so sum now over X in FQ to the new, chi nu 
of f of x psi nu. So you just compose with norm and trace. It's the same polynomial, um, but you plug in values from the extension field, but then compose with norm and trace uh, to apply the original characters psi, chi and psi. So this is the, the character sum upstairs. And the key point is, if I understand the basic character sum, of course, this is the goal. I, I want to understand the basic character sum S. But suppose I know what the character sum S is, then I know what the character sum S mu is. Because both of them appear as the first coefficient in the L function, they have a relation between the two L functions. So then S nu is of the form omega j to the power nu, j from one to n plus m minus one. For certain complex numbers, omega j in C. Yeah, I mean, this is not an empty statement. Of course, a priori, we have no idea what the omega j's are. But this is nevertheless not an empty statement because we know that within the tower of news, these character sums behave very regularly. Even though we don't know what the omega j's are, we know that if we go up the tower, we just get new powers. Yeah? Okay, why is this the case? Well, this is just a restatement of what we have had earlier. So we have a factorization L S psi is some J from one to N plus M minus one, one minus omega J Q to the minus S for certain omega J's that we don't know. Yeah, simply because we know it's a polynomial in Q to the minus S of a certain degree, and then we factorize it. Okay, but then from the previous lemma, so from 3.6, we know that L nu S psi is essentially the same product, except that I have to take nu powers. Okay. And now we remember that the first coefficient of L nu just gives me S nu, and remember the first coefficient is now taken with respect to the norm in FQ to the nu. So I really just take minus the sum of the roots. Yeah. So we know that S nu is minus the sum of the roots. So minus omega one to the nu minus and so on, minus omega nu. Uh, sorry, omega n plus m minus one to the new, and maybe I should be a bit more careful and put a minus sign here in the statement of the, uh, of the theorem. So that we know from 3.4, telling us that the first coefficient is just the character sum, and the first coefficient can be expressed in terms of the sum of the roots. All right, let's look at an example. And these are the original Hasse-Davenport relations. So this is classical, this is Hasse-Davenport from 1935. Take Gauss sums. These are the simplest non-trivial character sums, Gauss sums. So in this case, it's just an additive character and a multiplicative character with the polynomial X. So choose F equal to G equal to X. Both have degree one. So with N equals M equals one. So how many roots do we have? The number of roots is N plus M minus one. So in this case, it's one. So also suppose that at least chi is non-trivial. 
tie non-trivial. Yeah, then our, our sum S, which is S1, is sum X in FQ, chi of X, psi of X. Okay, so this is the typical Gauss sum. And um, the extension sum S nu is sum X in FQ to the nu, chi of norm X, times psi of trace x. Okay. And now we know, I mean, there's only one root. Uh, so we know S1 is that one root up to sine and S nu is the nth power. So we conclude S nu which is minus that one root omega to the new equals minus one to the new plus one S one to the new, which is just a different way of writing minus one to the new plus one times minus omega to the new. And you see, that this and this is the same, so this and this is the same, and this equation is the so-called Hasse-Davenport relation for Gauss sums. The Gauss sum over the extension field is just the nth power of the original Gauss sum. In this case, it's particularly easy because n plus m minus one equals one. Yeah, so that's somehow the, the simplest case that you can think of. If you have more than one root, then of course, things become more complicated. There's not, not such an easy relation, um, but uh, yeah, anyway. All right, are there any questions? Yes, did, um, what's it called, Hase and Davenport, did yes. they prove this relation by looking at the L functions? Well, to be honest, that I don't know. But I mean, in this, probably they, they used an approach. That's my telephone, by the way. Uh, never mind. Um, <laughs> so uh, they used an approach that is equivalent. I mean, okay. if, uh, if F and G are just X, you can all of the, I mean, you can do this by bare hands. Um, but then if you somehow, if you put this in abstract language, then you get these L functions. So, so I guess what they, what they did is something that's equivalent to what I presented here, but probably in different language, but I haven't looked up the, the original source. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but we learned several things from this discussion. We learned that character sums are given by a sum of certain complex numbers and we know how many complex numbers, namely n plus m minus one, yeah, where n is the number of distinct zeros of f, g is the degree, uh, n, is, so n is the degree of g, m is the number of, of distinct zeros of f. And so each character sum is a sum of a small number of things. And the character sum over the extension field is the sum of the same number of things and you just take the nth power, yeah? That's already very useful, right? So it, it remains to bound these roots. Yeah? And this is essentially the same as proving the Riemann hypothesis over finite fields. I mean, we look at the factorization of the L function and we need to see where are the zeros of, of this L function. And um, yeah, we need to bound these roots, omega j. This is essentially, uh, I mean, the best possible bound uh, for, these, for the size of these roots is... Uh, uh, the Riemann hypothesis. All right, so that's our goal. I mean, up until now, we haven't said anything about these roots themselves. I mean, we just know what happens if I go up the tower, but if I have no knowledge on the roots, then, I mean, this is, I, I need to have some input for the algorithm, yeah? Uh, if I have no input, then this doesn't help at all. 
Okay, but this was the preparation. We can use the input that we proved yesterday and on Monday on point counting. This will be now the input and then going up the extension fields uh, will result in a self-improving estimate. And that's uh, what I'm going to do now. So that's chapter four. The main results. And we start with a pretty cool lemma. This is the source of the self-improvement. Okay, here's the, here's the uh, dilemma. So suppose you're given K numbers that I call omega one to omega K, any complex numbers. And suppose there exists, there exist two constants, C and B positive, such that if I take the nth of the nth powers then this is bounded by c times b to the n for all n and the constants are independent of n but otherwise they can be anything then I get bounds for each individual omega and miraculously the constant C completely disappears. Then omega J is cleanly bounded by B. This is, I mean, this is not analytic number theory. There is no implied constant. I mean, this is really an honest inequality sign without implied constant for one less than J less than K. Okay, if you think about this, uh, first it looks very, very exciting, but, but then if you think about it, of course, it's relatively simple. And there are many ways of proving this. And maybe the most elegant way is to use complex analysis. After all, we want to have a little bit of analysis. After all, I mean, this, this whole um, trimester program is called uh, harmonic analysis and, and analytic number theory. So we want to see a little bit of analysis. So I look at a power series. I look at the power series F of Z is sum N from zero to infinity, sum J from one to K, omega J to the K, Z to the N. And of course, this, the sum over n is a geometric series. So this is, sorry, not k. This is nonsense. Um, this is supposed to be n. So the sum over n is a geometric series. So this is j from one to k, one over one minus omega j z. Okay, now in the whole, I mean, what, what, what do you do with, uh, with holomorphic functions? You want to know uh, what's the radius of convergence. And um, I mean, this is a holomorphic function in a neighborhood of zero. And what do you know about the radius of convergence? By assumption. Now, if I look at the coefficients, these are bounded by a constant times b to the n. Yeah, that's my assumption. So F is absolutely convergent in real part, uh, sorry, in absolute value of Z. Absolute value of Z less than one over B. 
Okay, so, but then it's analytic, power series are analytic. So there is no pole. So that means this has no pole in, the re in this region. And so omega j inverse in absolute value must be greater than one over b. And that's precisely the statement for all j. There are other ways to prove this, um, but that's maybe the quickest. All right, and this, you, I mean, you can already guess uh, what we do now. Um, the idea is we have a, a point counting lemma that we can use to bound character sums over the ground field with lots of implied constants. But if we go up in our, in our extension fields, we will get the exact same constants but over the extension fields. And then we use the self-improving lemma and the constants just disappear. It's the same as, as, as I said last time, if you want to prove Ramanujan using functor reality, you use higher and higher uh, symmetric powers. And um, in the beginning, the implied constants are very bad, but if you, it, it's, it, they stay to be, I mean, they remain the same constants uh, if, you, if you take higher symmetric powers. And then eventually, if you take the limit, they simply disappear. Okay, so here's the main theorem. And the theorem is as follows. And that's really the clean bound, uh, and in fact, the best possible bound for a multiplicative character set. So take a character in FQ star, And suppose the order is D, let F in FQX be a polynomial with M distinct zeros in FQ bar. And as usual, suppose that y to the d minus f of x is absolutely irreducible. Then the, the multiplicative, so this is not the mixed character sum, this is only the multiplicative character sum, is bounded by m minus one times square root q. Okay, and this is again an honest inequality sign. Um, the implied constant is one, it's m minus one times square root q. And um, yeah, so, so in general, it would be m plus n minus one, but n is zero in our case because there is no additive character. And um, yeah, I mean, for instance, if, uh, I mean, this is even correct if m is one, if m is one, then uh, f is something like f of x is like x, or it's uh, it has or x squared or whatever. And um, then, if you of course, if you sum the character, if you just sum chi of x, you get zero. So this is really true in in all cases. All right, um, and okay, and it's it's best possible. To keep the tension a little bit, um, I will prove this tomorrow. Today is my son's birthday and he's already waiting to open up his presents. And that's why I finish a little earlier than usual. And um, yeah, you can enjoy the sun, sun or you can already prove this as a homework if you want, but I'll present a full proof tomorrow. I can tell you already what the ingredients are. Um, we will use the point counting. So first of all, we will transform this as in the motivating example, we will transform this into a point counting problem. We will use our previous results for point counting. Then we will go up the extension field and uh, use 
the self-improving lemma to remove all the implied constants. And in the end, we get this result.